Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Mein Name ist Anna Balestrem und ich heiße Sie sehr herzlich zu unserer kleinen virtuellen Geisterstunde willkommen. Sie sehen uns, wir sehen Sie nicht. Das liegt daran, dass wir ganz alleine sind hier ähm, in Berlin, in der Fasanenstraße, in der Villa Griesebach vorm Kamin, während Sie irgendwo da draußen im Netz hängen. Aber Sie folgen uns und sehen uns zu, das freut uns. Ich hoffe, Sie auch. Heute Abend sitzen wir, und ich sage, ich sage gleich, wer das ist, hier an diesem Kamin, in dem ein fröhliches Feuer flackert. Ich hoffe, Sie können das auch gut erkennen, da hinten flackerndes Feuer. Und reden über Geister. <lacht> Anlass dafür ist ein neues Buch von Lianne Chapton. Lianne ist eine kanadische Autorin, Illustratorin und Künstlerin, doch das Buch ist gerade auf Deutsch bei Suhrkamp erschienen und heißt einfach, Daniel, what have you done with the later <lacht> heißt einfach Gästebuch. Later, later, I'll tell you later. She tell you later. <lacht> es geht darin eben um besondere Gäste, nämlich Geister. Sie merken schon, Gäste, Geister, die Sprache enthüllt da eine stille Verwandtschaft. Übrigens nicht nur die deutsche Sprache, denn Guests and Ghosts and Hosts liegt auch im Englischen dicht beieinander. Lien wollte eigentlich in diesem Jahr eine wundervolle Ausstellung hier bei Griesebach machen. Das ging nicht. Das machen wir dann, wenn das Virus entweder besiegt oder wir uns daran gewöhnt haben. Eins von beiden wird ja sicher geschehen. Jetzt freuen wir uns, dass wir ihr Buch vorstellen können und dass Lien dafür live aus New York zugeschaltet ist. Hi Lien! Ich freue mich außerdem sehr, Ihnen die beiden anderen Gäste vorzustellen die mit Lianne reden werden. Wir heißen Daniel Kehlmann, sehr herzlich willkommen, den ich ihm nicht vorstellen muss. Daniel ist einfach der berühmteste und erfolgreichste deutsche Gegenwartsschriftsteller. Er ist außerdem ein großer Kenner der Literaturgeschichte und hat darüber wunderbare Essays geschrieben. Einige davon kann man in einem Buch lesen, der sein, in einem Band lesen, der seine Frankfurter Poetikvorlesung zusammenfasst und dieser Band heißt Kommt Geister. Passt also auch. Dass Daniel heute hier sitzen kann, verdanken wir übrigens Corona. Denn bis vor kurzem hat Daniel mit seiner Familie in New York gelebt und ist dann aber im Sommer nach Berlin gezogen. Das Virus hat auch Vorteile. Herzlich willkommen, lieber Daniel. Wir heißen auch Niklas Mark. Sehr herzlich willkommen. Niklas ist Journalist bei der FAZ. Er ist Kunstkritiker, Professor, obwohl er nicht so aussieht. Er ist einer der einflussreichen Public Intellectual, schönes Wort, das ich immer schon mal benutzen wollte, und außerdem Autor eines Buches, das vor kurzem erschienen ist, Technophoria, in dem es auf die eine oder andere Weise auch um Gespenster geht, die heute eine andere Form annehmen als in den Spukgeschichten des 19. Jahrhunderts. Außerdem haben Niklas und Lien auch ein wunderbares Buch über Manhattan gemacht, in dem eine Geistergeschichte vorkommt. Lieber Niklas, auch dir ein herzliches Willkommen. Um, I think I don't have a lot to do in moderating this, but I, ha I, only, I only have a first question, and that is to Liane. Liane, how can one describe ghosts better? By language or by illustration? I think I think we have to translate because uh, Leanne doesn't hear that this microphone, so yeah. she can only hear our microphone. Yeah. So, so the question Anna asked you was, uh, how do you, uh, how, how do we, how how can one describe ghosts best by language or by illustration? Probably language. Um, because uh, there's a certain formlessness to the idea of um, ghosts, I think. So in, in this case, I would say language on the whole, but what I, what I tried to do was um, use images to impart emotion the way that language does. So you would say the 
But I don't know, what do you think? Which part is the primary part of the book and the illustrations are kind of an add-on? Or, or, uh, because it, it didn't seem like that to me, uh, that, but, but that's not what you're saying. No, I wanted to see if um, images could do the heavy lifting of the ghost story. Um, but, I, but I still did rely on language to put space between uh, between the reader and the experience of the ghost, I guess. Yeah. I think what, what I really like about the book is that sometimes you, you see the image and then as we all do it, when we come to a museum, we see an image, um, a picture, and um, we, we look at the caption. So we look for words to explain what we see in the image. That's almost an automatic reaction to an image. I try to find text that explains something to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I have the experience to look at the book at all these images that you collect there. And sometimes uh, they're paintings, sometimes they're photos. And immediately I look at, after the caption, after a caption. And then you, you stumble into a labyrinth of text that sometimes seems to explain the image, sometimes tells a totally un, seemingly unrelated story. And the further you uh, get lost in that unrelated story, the further you feel that it has something to do with the, the image. So I think in the way you, you built that book, and that's why I think it's, it's also so beautiful how images and text work together, there is a, an essence of what makes something uncanny and haunted in the very format that you create between image and, and text. And maybe, maybe it's interesting also for those who, who hear about the book for the first time, um, that you could maybe talk a little bit about how you, how you work with text and image. Uh, and maybe you can tell us an example how, how you brought both together and how you created that, that uh, uncanny gap between the two of them. Sure, and I guess for an example I'll use um, Christmas Eve, the, the piece in the book that occurs on Christmas Eve. I'm just looking for a, a copy of the book so I can make this example. So in this case, the ghost I was thinking about at Christmas were um, the ghosts that recur and appear in the imagery around in particular. And um, I was looking to wrapping paper and the way that the idea of silent night, starry night was depicted. And in a lot of wrapping paper, which is possibly the most sort of throwaway um, popular image uh, conveyor, um, I found a lot of um, images where there were stars on a very dark background. So I started collecting those images in particular. And so in this case, the, the images came first. Because I wanted the reader to remember the sort of darkness and mood in this kind of image. Even though these look sort of festive and everything, there's, there's a dark palette, there's a real mood, I think, to this. And so, um, and again, the stars on a dark ground, um, I don't know, this is a, this is a sort of an interesting, I just find that mood, not a cheerful, very cheerful mood. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I collected all of these pieces of wrapping paper. A lot of them were from the fifties and sixties. And I began to sort of work on the idea that Christmas time is the actual, actual more popular time to tell ghost stories. It's actually not Halloween. You remember the dead, you know, uh, Christmas Carol, actually the dead by James Joyce. There are all these stories that happen around the holiday. And I find, again, I find Christmas time a very spooky time. It's often sad. Um, and so I started to write about the sadness around a divorce, frankly and around the sort of bodies that used to be there and what happened at Christmas parties when you want to make small talk but you wind up talking about the dead. So I collected those stories to sort of um, chart the night 
uh, in ter you know, ch chart the night of Christmas Eve. So in that case, the, the tone of darkness around Christmas came first through the images. It, it, it's very interesting that um, some of the ghost stories that, uh, that you wrote in the book and uh, also, also the ghost story that, uh, that uh, Daniel wrote, which was one of my favorite uh, uh, ghost stories uh, 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 of de decades. Uh, so uh, I think in both cases... It's perfect. It, it, it's the it, most perfect ghost story. I've told Daniel this. It's <laughs> yeah. incredible. But I think it's the interesting, which I think connects yours and Daniel's in a way, is also the idea that the uncanny lies also uh, grounded not so much in an old house or in a spooky circumstance, but in the very heart of an unhappy family. And that if, you, if I think about the wrapping paper, it's also, it's just waiting to be torn away in all these images that tell you about happiness and uh, about being happy together under a Christmas tree, which is the epitome of a happy family. That is waiting to be torn away and destroyed and, uh, uh, and nailed together and thrown away. And I think, it, it, I would love to talk about uh, uh, ghosts and, and uh, unhappy families because I think that is, in both of your books, a very strong uh, uh, underlying current of all the uncanny e events. I get, a, I get a little note from, um, from our camera team that you should put on your uh, um, uh, headset. It was much better to, to hear you with uh, the okay. thing on. So, right, is that so, better? So now it's better, but yeah. Um, I can barely hear Nicholas. Is it better now? Can, is it better we, we on your We can hear you very well. We just hear you and the fireplace. No? Maybe Daniel tries. He, I, I, can you hear me? Does it work? Can you hear me? Yeah, Daniel's a little louder. Okay, okay I turned into a ghost now, so <laughs> you have to take over. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Maybe just hold your mic closer to your mouth, Nicholas. Um, yeah, but in, in, while we're figuring this out, I, I, I'd like to say something about uh, what, what Nicholas just mentioned, that it is very interesting. I think if you look at the history of the ghost story, um, the great ghost stories always connect these two elements. One element is what is a ghost, and... Uh, uh, we can talk about that, and I have a, I have a few kind of theories about that. What is what what is a ghost in our imagination? W what makes ghosts? Uh, in what circumstances are we afraid of ghosts? I think one of the things that come into place that ghosts in in many ways are always connected to buildings. Um, not always, but kind of in our culture, in our world, there are also ghosts prominently in, in, in nomad, cul nomad cultures. Uh, uh, is, is no, how do you pronounce that? Nomad or nomad? Nomad, like nomaden. How nomad, do you say yeah. that? Nomads, yeah. Um, but in our culture, it's usually connected to our uh, fear and fascination for the past of our buildings. The fact that people were in our buildings before we were here and we don't know what they did and who they were. So, um, but the other thing is, the, the, the ghost stories that are really meaningful and powerful, even up to modern horror movies, uh, always in some way capture something about problems that are very timely. Um, and there is something that I cannot quite put my finger to, and I don't quite understand it, but I think there is something fascinating about how talking about ghosts, which is such an old form of, of, of storytelling, obviously, um, makes it easier in many ways to talk about very personal and very, also very timely issues, even, even political issues. Like if I think about a movie like Us, it's the most interesting political movie uh, I've seen in a long time, and it's kind of a horror story. It's not quite a ghost story, but a horror, a horror movie. So, yeah, I guess my question is, do you have any, any theory about why that is, about that weird connection between the, the classic elements of the ghost story, which pretty much never change, and the weird way in which the ghost story is open for very contemporary um, 
questions or matters, subject matter. Yeah, that's, that's great. You brought up sort of 17 different things I want to talk about. <laughs> one, um, one idea is this idea of place and, and, and these structures that were occupied by people who have since died. I mean, that, that's, a, that's just true to life. You know, the, the classic story of, of the ghost and the haunting being of the undead, um, that's sort of almost the scaffolding upon which, you know, upon which any ghost story can be told. The idea that it reflects our time is really interesting because I think what we're haunted by um, changes probably every generation. Um, I mean, what I'm really interested in is, is the, uh, are the ghosts that happen in photography, you know, photographs, this idea of memento mori, this idea of trying to preserve uh, the living, the, the, the sort of um, idea that you can, through image, keep something undead, but also that you Uh, we, we lost the sound. We lost the sound. We Sorry. The sound. Is there anything you did you did you do anything that we lost the sound? That's not good. Mm. <laughs> we can't hear. Maybe maybe unplug the, the maybe unplug the the headset. It is unplugged. Maybe we should write uh, uh, a letter. <laughs> no, she, she, she can hear us. She, she can hear us. It's just yeah, we can't hear you. So no. what, what are we going to do now? Maybe. Yeah, can you refresh your browser? Yeah, she'll be, she'll be back. Did yeah. that work? Yeah, it, it, it did work. It worked. It worked. You're back. <laughs> it worked. Okay. Kind of Sorry about that. that. Yeah. Where was I? <laughs> you were gone, and you're back. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Ghost story. Okay, so there. I guess what I was saying was, um, I feel like our ghosts are uh, live in photography right now, in how we speak through photography. Is that squeaking because of the speaker? I think we maybe there was a headphone again. No, no, we, we hear you very well, but there is also an echo. May I think there is a, maybe an echo from your computer. That, uh, okay, is that working? Yeah. Good. Good. Perfect. Good. Good. Yeah. Good. It okay. <laughs> it's <good>. Okay. <laughs> So now yeah, I've completely, completely lost my for, you, We're talking about photography. Photography, so. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think photography is a locus and a location and a place where ghosts happen, the way we rely on it, the way we use it, the way we communicate through it, the way we long for it, the way it works on our own desires. Um, and I think maybe, Daniel, that's why the ghost story can change and be very contemporary while also talking just about essentially life and death. And family, I do think that a lot of ghosts are located in family. I mean, what are, what's, what, what's DNA and genes but ghosts in some ways? Traces. Yeah. Also, I think I was very interested also what you said, uh, Leanne and Daniel, about about the houses that we can, if we think about a ghost, we immediately think of a house, and mostly we think about an old haunted house where basically some some his, his, history which is not graspable, which is unknown to us, reemerges, and then there are kind of revenants coming from a yeah. time that we don't know. And uh, on the other hand, I find it fascinating to see that you both in your uh, uh, your books, your ghost stories. Um, made a very interesting leap into the contemporary condition. So Daniel, in Daniel's uh, uh, novel, it's a contemporary house, kind of a designy, slightly annoyingly uh, 
uh, um, uh, uh, um, spa-like uh, building okay. in the mountains. So it's not a classical thing uh, like in Edgar Allan Poe, uh, uh, if the house usher, it, it has a crack, it's almost collapsing. But in your case, it, everything is fine, everything is ready to relax. So they, it, it's, a, it's a modern house, which is creepy, and I think the, 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 maybe the most horrible scene in Daniel's uh, novel is when someone looks at a kind of a baby TV that uh, supervises the, 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 the child in the other room, and the child was supposed to sleep, but instead it's looking, it's sitting there and it has wide eyes. It's so creepy. And <laughs> I think uh, similarly brilliant is in, in Leanne's book, there is a very contemporary ghost, an actor, Edward Mintz, who manages to show up at what uh, a dozen, dozens of events in one night where you think this is physically not possible. So both uh, you, you wrote uh, uh, ghost stories about technology also. Mm -hmm. and, and the uncanny thing is in technology. And that brings me to a point that I think a huge wave in the history of ghost stories starts uh, uh, in, in the early, 19th, uh, early 20th century, like a second wave, when, when electricity comes, mm -hmm. comes out. And, and many, many contemporaries were scared by electricity, like A.B. Warburg, uh, the, the art historian, he said, I'm deeply scared of the loss of a, a space of dis distanciations. Things are coming close to me. Images are coming with a, with a speed of light to, to, to me, and, and sound is coming with a speed of light to me, and I have no, no moments to, to distance anymore. So, and this is, of course, a very uncanny thing, that things come so close to you that they touch you, and, uh, uh, and you lose that distance harm. So I think I, 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 it would be uh, fascinating if you both could maybe talk about uh, how you, you came up with these modern ghosts, with these contemporary ghosts that have to do also with the age of uh, digitalization and the promise of our age of digitalization to uh, control everything. Huh? Because it's all about like control, control of your image in Leanne's book, control of the beloved ones through cameras in your book. And I think that's very interesting that you're not writing the cliche book of yeah, <laughs> door goes up and monster comes out, but the monsters are very different there. They are modern monsters. Daniel, did you read The Velt by Ray Bradbury ever? I did read all of Bradbury, but a long time ago. So they kind of, the stories blend into each other. I, le I read them when I was 14 or 15 and I was terribly afraid. So which one is, which one is that? So The Velt is about a house in the future. In oh, the with the screens future, everywhere, where, right? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I read yes. that. I Your read book that. reminded me so much of the horror <laughs> and of bullying in the Velt, where the children sort of, uh, these two children sort of um, re disconnect from their parents and always watch an image of an African Velt mm. and everything in the house sort of, anyway, um, I was wondering if the, 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 I was just, um, yeah, wondering if you'd, if you'd um, th thought about that house. But no, please go ahead with Nicholas's question. Yeah, I think it's, 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 it's perfect. Also, that's one of my, of my favorite modern haunted houses because then people are haunted by uh, fiction becoming all of a sudden a reality. It's the lions in that story who are projections in the space uh, in that house, lions who are projected, who finally become real lions and eat up the, the inhabitants of the house. So the house doesn't let anyone out anymore because fiction be turns mm -hmm. into reality. I think that's a beautiful uh, which logical also, concept. Which also yeah. happens in what is, in my opinion, the best modern horror movie, The Ring, yeah. where, uh, where literally the thing that you're afraid of, which is, I mean, on a meta level, you're always afraid of, whenever you watch any kind of horror movie, you're afraid of that what you just saw might happen to you when the movie is over and you go to bed. Like, of course, how can you not? If you're afraid, that's kind of what part of you, the childish part that's still there is afraid of. And in The Ring, that's yeah. literally what happens. <laughs> so, like, Samara comes through the yeah. TV. So, in a way, that's the... Um, I would say even more sophisticated and brilliant version of that Ray Bradbury idea of the yeah. screen coming, yeah. coming, coming to life. But it's interesting that, that basically every new technology produces its own form of horror, huh? mm -hmm. its own form of anxieties. And, 
and and that's why I also wanted to talk with Leanne about about Edward Mintz and that that actor. And I talked with Daniel uh, uh, about it, and uh, yeah. we, we can maybe promise we we can. We can uh, uh, um, it's not a secret that you thought it's completely made up, uh, the idea I, yeah, yeah, yeah. of I th an actor. So I thought actor. it was just a brilliant idea, which of course it is, but then Nicholas told me that there's some uh, reality, uh, re real world uh, uh, inspiration for that. <laughs> yeah, well, I liked the idea of um, the vain ghost, the sort of um, Dorian Gray uh, horror story of um, a man's vanity and a man's sort of place in society, um, uh, sort of working away at his soul. And um, there was also, there's also this, you know, huge business in party pictures and society pictures in, you know, night out, who's who's on the guest list, but you know, talk of the tent, like this version of proving who you are through where you've been, who you've stood next, to what parties you've attended, and those figures in the um, in the photographs, to me reminded me of Dorian Gray, and so I cast my friend um, Paul, the man in the blue suit, to be this character. And Mince comes from the idea of minstrel, comes from you know this idea of a sort of a spirit, um, and I I, uh, I it was very much based on, but. You know, pre-pandemic, there were probably about 42 bad and good parties and launches and events happening in New York City. And what if you were invited to all of them? And what if it was um, crucial to your sort of sense of yourself to show up at all of them and be photographed at all of them? And it just seemed to me like a, a very real, in terms of um, identity, uh, affliction or state. And so I think I shot it in, over the course of two nights and just stood Paul next to all sorts of different people um, based on the postures in these party pictures. Um, I, but actually, yeah, it, I actually are, remember yeah. when you sent around an email saying you, were look, you needed people for, for a photo shoot, for a sim party simulation, for, yeah, for a book. Yeah, where were you? Why didn't you come? I was not in town. I would have loved to be in there. I was so angry at myself when I saw that in the book. I was like, I could have been in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what would I have think been your so party? a lot of our friends are you <laughs> Sorry? Wait, wait, what's your Jeffy favorite Jeffy Jennings party in the is in there. My um, bunch of writers. <laughs> Yeah, my favorite one is this. Is th my favorite party picture is the one with Jeff Eugenides. He looks like a deer caught in a headlight, <laughs> and, 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 which is great. <laughs> totally. He didn't know what he was getting into. I think Nicholas dragged him to the party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but was there a real? But it Nic happened. Nic Nicholas said there is some. There was some real person whom you researched who was at thirty-seven parties in in, in one night. Well, I feel like there are these figures in in that world who do mm -hmm. show up at um, parties over and over and over again. Yeah, I, I, yeah. They were sort of, it was sort of based on two people, a man mm -hmm. and a woman, who I felt made those um, appearances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is there is one yeah. ghost story, which is also one of my favorite ghost stories in the book that seems to have nothing to do with ghosts. It's about a tennis player. Mm -hmm. I think tennis is the whitest, sunniest, uh, unghosty sport that you could ever imagine. There's nothing, seemingly nothing dark about a tennis court uh, and, and playing in all in white clothes. So can you uh, talk a little bit about that, that white ghost uh, and, or that white yeah, person? Yeah, and this haunted. reminds me of, this reminds me of the sort of conversation that I love having with Daniel because he's seen and read everything I mean, I really wanted there to be a ghost story in the sports world. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like one of the last conversations we had when you were in New York, Daniel, was how many novels can you think of with protagonists who are actors? I remember, and yeah. And it's sort of like, I can't think of any lot, ghost right? stories that involve an athlete. <laughs> yeah. Except, and the closest I could come was horse racing in the Rocking Horse Winner, which is one of my favorite stories. And while the little boy isn't an athlete, it does surround the sort of sport, both game and, and you know, rigor of, of horse racing. Um, and so the tennis story, you know, it's about the darker side, the way that the, the, way the child wins in the um, 
rocking horse story really affected me, and I wanted a tennis player to win by darker means. Again, using uh, you know what Nick, what uh, Daniel was bringing up very early on, a, a contemporary innocent space. Mm -hmm. What I also found so impressive is, and I don't quite understand why, why are the black and white pictures in your book so scary? Uh, I mean, is there, is there something, was there some method you used in making the, for making them scarier? Because I, I was fascinated by that. I was staring at the pictures and I was thinking, why is this so frightening? And is, is it, it can't just be well, that they are bad quality, I mean, like, like uh, grainy or you don't see well. There is something really haunting about them. Well, there is grain. I added grain. Yeah. It's okay. all about filters. I mean, mm -hmm. again, it's technology. Think of how many filters are being added to our iPhones and to our you know, mm -hmm. Instagram accounts. I mean, filters inflect how we see things. And so with a lot of the black and white photographs, I added in this program called Alien Skin a sort of 25% filter and made sure in the printing there was extra black mm -hmm. because in crappier printing methods, um, you know, from the 60s and 70s, I knew that the inflection would be a little bit more mysterious. A lot of this book, the idea for the book came from a paperback copy of White Mischief by um, James Fox. And the photo signatures in that book were printed on this horrible pulpy paper, and you couldn't make out the figures in these images. And I loved how much I relied on the caption image mm -hmm. relationship in that book. And I wanted to recreate that. But you know what? I It's also budget. I mean, the publishers wouldn't give me a budget to run much color photography. <laughs> Well, that that was that was good. <laughs> that was good that they didn't do that. <laughs> it worked. It did. What do you think about the about the um, illustration and the and the interpretation of your book, Daniel, in the film, the ghost uh, story? I I I I really loved the acting. <laughs> uh, yeah. They were very good actors. I felt like the screenplay in some in some ways made. Uh, the decision consciously to make it more conventional than I wanted it yeah. to, to be. But I mean, I kind of, I'm kind of okay with that in general. It's like when, it's, it's, it's a funny experience because I wrote this little novella as kind of an unconventional take on the traditional horror story and then Blumhouse comes and takes it and turns it obviously back into the thing I yeah. used to, well, I used to get away from, from to, 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 to get to something, to a more original place. But that's kind of fascinating in itself. So I don't want to complain about that because then, so for example, I really don't like jump scares. And I also, you cannot, when you write a horror novella, you realize the one thing you cannot do on the written page is a jump scare. It's not doable. I wouldn't know how. I mean, the jump, also, I think yeah. the jump scare is quite low technique of frightening people because it's basically giving, slapping them in the face, uh, shouting at them <laughs> unexpectedly. And then, of course, the movie goes back to adding jump scares. And it's not what I would have done, but it's kind of, fun to see that happen so in a in so in a way i'm i'm okay with that but it's not the movie i would have made <laughs> yeah but i, I uh, had i actually I, had offers i had offers from two very good directors and one of them was really very intent on making it a very very strange eerie beautiful little art house movie and i decided no, I'm going for Blumhouse. Uh, I'm going with Blumhouse, and, and because I just how often, how often do you get that like a Blumhouse horror movie? So yeah, I'm not complaining. I think it was a, it was an awesome experience. Yeah, I get that too. I love Kevin Bacon. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's wonderful. <laughs>
But talking about films, I mean, we maybe also should look at the wall behind us. I think all the viewers yeah. can see that. Uh, there are images which uh, refer to a novel that has been turned into a film, uh, uh, Death in Venice by uh, Thomas Mann, Visconti. And uh, there we see a white figure, like uh, almost a classical guy, ghost. And it's also, so. Uh, what you said, Daniel, it, it's black and white, and it's at the same time a bit scary and very beautiful. And maybe um, we could um, lift the mystery uh, of, uh, uh, at least some mystery of these uh, paintings to the viewers and you could talk a little bit about that, that image of a film of a book uh, about the death in Venice. Could you talk about the, sure. the, these paintings? I mean, yeah. The, Daniel posed a question really early on. He said, what exactly, I think he said exactly is a ghost. And because I feel like a ghost is a reproduction, um, you know, whether it's of a memory, whether it's a, a trauma, whether it's of a of a person. Sometimes um, it's as simple as just a reproduction. And I loved how there's the Thomas Mann novella. And again, when you said novella, because your book is a novella, and the Thomas Mann is, uh, story is a novella, I wonder if there's a very um, classic thing of the ghost story being quite short. I mean, Beloved is also a ghost story, yeah. but why are ghost stories very short? And are all short stories ghost stories? I mean, we could argue. Anyway, what I loved about Death in Venice was it was turned into a movie that was very, very loyal to uh, the Thomas Mann story. There, um, There's very little dialogue. Uh, there's a lot of um, action described that's described in the book. There's also, um, in the book, it mentions a camera on the beach, you know, for the tourists on the Lido. And then in the film, there's a camera on the beach for the tourists in the Lido. And again, I think that maybe when Mann wrote that story, there was, um, there were ghosts of, you know, homosexuality, of love, of, of sort of um, thresholds that one couldn't cross, uh, that, were a contem that were contemporary stories happening then. Um, but I liked, you know, for reasons of, of copyright, I couldn't reproduce the, the images from the film. And so I made another reproduction of Tadzio and watercolored him in a very slightly abstracted way. So it was sort of going invisible image in Thomas Mann's text, visible image in, um, is, it Ant is it, who's the director? I'm so, not Antonioni. Um, yeah, Visconti. Visconti. Uh, there's, that, there's that physical photograph of, photographic filmic image of Tadzio. And then there's my uh, interpretation of the third kind of ghost of Tadzio or figure of Tadzio, and I, and I loved being able to slow it down into something even more abstracted. Um, so, wait, I think I'm going off topic, but yeah, I think generations and reproductions figure into the ghost story a lot, versions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. So the ghost, so, because it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to ask what is a ghost and what is a ghost in regard to the person that ghost was when he was still alive. And I think you're right, it, it, it's, a, it's a reproduction and it's always kind of an incomplete reproduction, right? It's like something of that person has been lost and the ghost is preserving parts of that person but not the complete person, and that's one of the reasons why we're afraid, right? But you just described a child, right? You just described <laughs> a, a son or a daughter. <laughs> yeah, good point. Oh, I have to think about that. <laughs> it was a totally new door to read your novella, uh, which is about a father and a child, right? And but the child is not one of the ghosts. The child, he has to protect the child from the, from the ghosts, yeah, which is... I, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's always <laughs> true, or because at the moment when the father mm -hmm. looks into the uh, baby TV yeah. and sees his, uh, 
child sitting on the bed with white eyes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it sounds as if it was... Which is, by the way, what happens, because yeah. they're using, uh, they're using yeah. UV uh, rays, so yeah, yeah. when the child does look into the, 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 the camera, then the, the eyes so beam looks, white. So it clearly looks like a revenor or yeah. something from outer space, but clearly not the human little being is, you want to protect. That is huh? true, that's the so uncanniness of the... Baby, yeah, yeah, I can't deny that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of a Stephen King moment where yeah. the kids uh, have turned into something really <laughs> creepy and scary. But everyone has that Stephen yeah. King moment when they use a baby monitor and the, the baby wakes up and stares <laughs> yeah, yeah. into the monitor for a but moment. It's just so an optical the, phenomenon, yeah. but it's yeah. really creepy. <laughs> and again, it's what, what Leanne says. It's, yeah, Did you ever hear about, this is what I heard about when I was using a baby monitor, that someone had hacked the kind of radio waves and was and was almost in a kind of Tourette's spew of, um, of, of sort of rude words, um, to sort of saying things through baby monitors. So you walk into the room and then hear all of this coarse language. It was really creepy, the, even the idea of that, just yep. this channel being hacked. Yeah, that's extremely <laughs> frightening. There was a big hack of this one company, Nest, who, use, who, who are selling baby, baby and home monitors and you can access them online, I mean, in your own home by using a password. And there was a big yeah. hack and they used it to frighten children. <laughs> like it's really, it's really, <laughs> it's actually, it's, it's kind of funny. It's of course not funny. It's like incredibly mean, but it's also kind of funny. Yeah, like, it was talking Barbie dolls, right? And these Barbie dolls. No, there was another hack. There was also, no, there but was that also happened, right? That yeah, also yeah, happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. People yeah. really like to frighten Oh my God, children. Daniel, you have to write a hacking ghost story. Yeah. <laughs> Well, somebody <laughs> did that in reality. Someone actually did hack the baby monitors and talk to the children. I love it. It's insane. <laughs> yeah, but because that's, that's also because then you understand something which is typical for every ghost story that is related to a house, because either you can't escape the house or mm -hmm. the ghosts in it. Uh, uh, so there, that's the hungry house, as it's in like ghost house theory. It eats you up. Yeah. Uh, or it just wants to push you away. So there are stay away houses and hungry houses, uh, according yeah. to some theory. Do you and guys I th think mm. that? I, do you guys think that there's um, in the tradition of ghost stories being cautionary tales that there's a moralistic idea around the ghost story? That's a good question. I don't. They. I don't think it. There should be. It's something people often try. And yeah. it's one, I mean, it, 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 it's a question about where, it, it depends on where you want to go with the story. It becomes immediately much less frightening as soon as a short story you read um, shows you any kind of moralistic Yeah, angle. or finger wagging. It's, it immediately <laughs> stops being frightening. Um, that's, by the way, why... Um, Asian, Japanese stories or horror movies are the most frightening ones because they, there is no, I mean, the victims have no way to redeem themselves in the Asian uh, ghost story because the ghost is not right. like a moral agent. The ghost is just some remnant of anger and, 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 and brute force and darkness. Um, so I think Initially, the ghost story doesn't have that, although there is all, there's often this angle where a ghost is a ghost because something stayed unresolved. But right. even that is not a moralistic to, thing. Also sorry. to, sorry. No, no, go I'm ahead. Getting the, the, <laughs> the delay here. But bringing it back to Nicholas's and, and a little bit your ghost story in the house and Nicholas's idea of, of um, you can't escape the house or the ghost can't escape the house, you know, is a house, I'm taking a leap here, but is a house sort of a stand-in for something you have to leave? Like, are all ghost stories essentially about leaving home or um, some, I don't know, how does both morality and architecture and family play into... Um, play into uh, ghosts? Well, I, it, it's an interesting question that, that basically the, the house is often used as a metaphor, but I think it's, it's even more interesting when the house 
represents a state uh, 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 of mind that we, for example, I think all, are all in, we all have a feeling that we can't escape a certain condition, we can't escape a certain, uh, we can't even escape the house in a very physical sense anymore. If I leave my house, my mobile phone is still sending information to the house. So uh, what is beautiful in Daniel's uh, novella is that the person leaves the house finally think, safe and sound, I'm out of that monster, and walks down the valley and comes back to the house and has to go back to the house. It's almost uh, uh, like a condition we all know that, that the house will never let you go because the house will basically track you. And, and that has been a metaphor until like 10 years ago, and now it's a reality because houses are actually really tracking you and houses <laughs> are actually measuring your sleep and houses are doing what yeah. is the most scary thing, they touch your body, so your eye watch uh, measures your sleep and <clears throat> then a monitor tells you in the morning when you wake up how your sleep performance, that's the official term, was. And I think that is a totally claustrophobic and monstrous development that kind of outpaces a lot of horror stories. Huh? That's actual horror. And also the idea that the house comes closer to the body, there's this beautiful uh, uh, story of, of, the, uh, of the bed just coming down, the ceiling coming down while you fall asleep. I think it's Edgar Allan Poe, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the person wakes up and the ceiling is a little lower, but we're almost in that situation that houses have become robots that eat us up, that, that uh, basically devour us, and we are basically part of the robot now. And I think that is a, is a form of contemporary horror in, in itself. That's amazing. Good yeah. observation. Something I'm often, I, I would like to ask you about, um, what can ghosts do in a story? Because I feel like there is a limit to what ghosts can do until they stop being ghosts in a story and become just characters. And I think that's, for example, a mistake that Stephen King often makes. If, 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 that's, if, if I'm allowed to say, to call it a mistake, <laughs> is even in Shining, it is so frightening as long as the ghosts are just there, but even a ghost that grabs the child and, and strangles the child isn't really frightening as a ghost anymore because that's just a bully. Mm. So, <laughs> is that, or at least that's my theory. So what do you think? What can ghosts actually do without losing their ghostly nature? Or is the answer they can't? They can just be there, like in The Turn of the Screw, which is in a way the perfect short story because the ghosts are just there but that's all they are. Yeah, I mean I guess the ghosts that I'm most afraid of do can, can only perform sort of psych psychological and emotional threat. Mm -hmm. If they, if they um, threaten physically, I find that to be a, horror, a terror story or something. Yeah. But the psychological and emotional threat, um, I feel like that's where it's a ghost. And then it's more mm -hmm. a monster story, I think, when there's physical threat yeah. or when that, that sort yeah. of um, line is crossed and they touch you. Um, but you're right. There's something that is um, <sighs> that has to remain um, on, on another side mm -hmm. somehow. They can never fully what give up that? being fictional. Uh, when they're not fictional at all, they're just annoying, bad behaving, as you say, monsters. So I think there yeah. is a degree of fictionality that they have to keep, and, uh, or it's like bad behavior. Without huh? turning into mm -hmm. characters. I would also yeah. think a ghost cannot yeah. be a character, yeah. or it's kind of comedy, like in Canterville Ghost, uh, that's, that's comedy when the yeah. ghost becomes a character yeah. in the story. Or it's children's stories about yeah. the little, I mean, the little, little ghost who, is, who cries and has fears and is angry. If we know that, it's yeah. actually basically not a ghost anymore. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It comes back to the, the, the root of the, the word, the sort of entomological thing, which is it, it has to have a spirit but not a, mm -hmm. um, not a foundation. You know, I guess a ghost, a role, but not necessarily a um, a pedestal or a place or something, I don't know. Can a ghost talk to us? In a, can a ghost talk? Or is that too much already? I'm not sure, I don't have, I don't have an answer to that myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think a ghost communicates. For a long time I thought we experience the ghosts that we deserve or we experience the ghosts that we're sensitive to. It comes down to sensitivity, it comes down to sort of um, 
to uh, what we what we seek ourselves in terms of um, being spoken to. I, I, it sounds like I'm being new agey here, but I'm 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 not. When I when I started to research ghost stories, all of the ghost stories that were written by women, um, sort of before maybe 1960, 70, had only five themes to them. I think I've spoken about this before. It was um, chi child, birth, marriage, the other woman, um, hysteria, and uh, did I say marriage? <laughs> and marriage again, it's like twice. But, um, but the fact that all these ghost stories, specifically the ones written by women, were all about emotional threat in the home was very, um, you know, very specific. Uh, and again, talked to kind of what, what people were worried about then and what what they were worried about being threatened. I'm, I'm not really answering the question, can they speak? I'm kind of thinking about that as I speak. I mean, there's always that idea of, of them speaking through. Again, there, there's, yeah. it's almost as though um, there has to be part of them gone for them to, mm -hmm. to be a ghost. Yeah, that's why I feel it makes. But there's also that yeah. you know you talked about the turn of the screw. That's actually in some ways one of my least favorite James, Henry James ghost stories. Mm -hmm. I really love uh, the Beast in the Jungle and the Friend of Friends, where the ghost mm -hmm. is a missed opportunity, a go a lost relationship, mm -hmm. where the ghosts aren't figures; they're spirits of mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. There is there is a, a very interesting chapter. So the book <coughs> consists of um, many chapters, and they have titles. One title is a title that I, I really love um, because it leads to uh, the question where uh, we become ghosts to ourselves, and it's called uh, "être chez soi," which in French means um, to to be at home, or as in America say, to be home. Uh, which is interesting because in America you say I'm home, you're identical with your, the building you're in. So there's a total feeling of uh, uh, identity, I am the building. Whereas the French have a much more skeptical, the Germans have a slightly depressed and romantic uh, relation to the home. It's a, ich gehe nach Hause, ich bin zu Hause. It means zu Hause means towards the home. So the, the melancholic German always is on his way home, but never there. So, uh, which <laughs> explains a lot of the melancholy that we uh, write. Uh, and, but the French have a very uh, fascinating concept that you refer on that title. It's être chez soi means that you're at somebody's place and that somebody is you. So you're, you're at, the at the same time a guest and a host. You have to give hospitality. You have to open the door to be uh, uh, fully yourself. And that is an, an intellectual concept that I find totally fascinating because everything that people in a ghost story are fearing to have to open the door, to have somebody else in the building, which is a nightmare, huh? to a certain point, is the prerequisite of really being yourself, really feeling at home, feeling safe and sound. And I think that's something really fascinating. Could you talk a little bit about that uh, paradox of uh, being the host and the guest at the sure. same time? And the I guest mean, it the makes host. me think of a lot of phrases. I mean, when I, you told me about that phrase, that French phrase, Nicholas, and I thank you. Um, and so I named that that piece, Etre Chez Soi, which I understood to mean almost make yourself at home. Uh, and then I remembered all these other phrases, um, like there's a very shaming phrase, um, who are you when you're at home, that the English use, which is belittling. It's sort of like, if you're out in the world and you say something, well, who are you when you're at home? That's the true you, you know, you're just a whatever. Um, but yeah, that, that play it reminds me also of the play between guest and host, that they're rooted in the same word. Um, also, again, bringing back uh, the idea to Daniel's story, the idea of, and very contemporary idea of being a guest in a, a home that you, where you don't know the owners, um, but there's vestiges of them in the, um, in the inside of the house. I don't know. I, it's a. I loved, loved, loved the idea of um, being both guest and host. And you know, what role are you more comfortable in? 
they're both very, to me anyway, they're both very uncomfortable positions. Even yeah. though I love entertaining, I love when people come over. Um, I'm probably a better host than a guest. I'm much more nervous as a guest. But when you think about actually inhabiting those roles, they're not you. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're, I don't know, maybe if you're a maitre d' or you own a restaurant or something. I mean, yeah. that's another, haunted restaurants could be a whole other vein. But what are you more comfortable as, Daniel, guest or host? Um, oh, definitely guest. <laughs> definitely <laughs> guest. I'm, I'm a very nervous host. <laughs> Nicholas, what about you? I would also go for guests uh, <laughs> because you're, you can behave uh, more irresponsible and you don't have to take care of all the other people. Just have to present yourself. Oh my you... God, I find it the opposite. <laughs> I'm on my best behavior as a guest when really as a, as a host, I could disappear for, you know, half an hour most of the time. I don't know. Maybe that's not true, yeah. but. Okay, we're coming. Yeah, but maybe you can say a word because Etrich uh, well leads us to also the convergence of Gäste and Geister, guests and ghosts, which is etymologically very close. Uh, uh, so what brought you to that title? I think there was a poem that uh, sparked that, that title of the book. Yeah, there's, so I have a friend of mine who exists only as a, a sort of a ghost now. He died in 2007. He was a writer. He just started to be published. His name was Adam Gilders. And he stayed at my, as a guest at my parents' house once, and they have a horrible little <laughs> guest book in their guest room. Um, that nobody ever writes in, but Adam in 1995 wrote the epigraph. Can you read it out, um, Nicholas? Okay, I'm. Um, <clears throat> so I'm he doing wrote it, this epigraph in my in, parents' in guest book, yeah. and he signed oh, it's it in Bert Lahr. Okay, it's a geist. And a, Bert Lahr is yeah. a dead actor who um, played the cowardly lion that 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 um, mm. that Adam was obsessed with because. Bert Lahr also played the Cowardly Lion, but also played, was sort of Beckett's leading actor in, he, he was in the first production of Waiting for the Dog. Again, what more ghostly than an actor who can go between Cowardly Lion and Vladimir or Estragon or whatever. Um, anyway, do you want to read out the little poem? Yeah, sure. Um, so I almost titled the book this. Okay. <clears throat> do you want to read it? Should I read it? I can read it. So it's no, a geist, right. a gust, a ghost, a ghast, I guess, a guest. It's very beautiful. So I thought maybe that could be the title. And then I just thought, no, I'll give, I think Adam should take that credit and use it as the epigraph. And then went back to where that, where I found that poem, which was in my parents' guest book. So in Germany, so the cover changed, as uh, people might see when we hold both covers, uh, from an iceberg to flowers. Um, I, I can see something um, ghostly uh, and uncanny in an uh, iceberg, but, uh, but maybe the book also almost ends with flowers. Could you say a word about um, uh, the scariness or the be scary beauty or the beautiful scariness of flowers? Sure. I mean, cut flowers. What? I mean, it's sort of like this decapitation that we have decorating our houses, you know, all the time. There's like those Fantin Latours. There's cut flowers have always been um, very decorative, very beautiful, but they're, you're essentially killing this plant, like beheading this plant. Um, there's also, uh, you know, it, it is a very uh, vanitas image, the idea of a, a cut flower. Um, showing kind of the the going from bloom to to ash and so i don't know i i love the idea of cut flowers i love cut flowers themselves um also i had i found once these incredible um ceramic flowers that the victorians would place in front of gravestones and they would just stay there in graveyards and and sort of not ever change and so I've always found flowers and depictions of flowers to be quite ghostly because they have this finite, um, uh, you know, finite sense to them, very short life. Yeah. <laughs> what a, I don't know. Great. 
So um, I get a sign from uh, the invisible, our invisible hosts here. I, I think we, we could talk on for hours. I'd love to do that, but, um, but our ghost, uh, ghost hosts are giving us the sign that we, we have to end. So um, thank you so much, Leanne, for being here uh, as a very visible and lively ghost. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. It was great to uh -huh. talk to you. Uh, and well, I uh, miss you guys so much. <laughs> any excuse to get yeah, and, near you somehow. It's oh yeah, and also so I nice think I have to answer you. the yeah. question about yeah. the lederhosen that you yeah. asked in the oh, beginning. Yeah, the oh, yeah. Otherwise <laughs> people will just not be able to sleep because they want to know what you meant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll just uh, uh, Lien and, uh, and, and a few other friends found the Bavarian lederhosen on a, on a, on a what kind of flea market, right? It was some kind of garage sale or flea market. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a sort of a vintage clothing sale. And they sent it to me, but they sent, before they sent it, they said they're going to send a present and they need a picture as confirmation. <laughs> So I took that picture of me in Lederhosen and I sent it and uh, yeah, now of course uh, I'm, of, I'm, I'm exposed to blackmail from any of you guys because you have that picture, <laughs> but you're decent people so none of you blackmailed me, but to your question, I, I, still, have the, I still have that, I still have it. Good, uh, it's I, still they somewhere. look so good on you, everyone was marveling at your legs. Thank you. That, that's, that's a great note to end the evening. <laughs> on. Okay, so we added, we added another ghost, uh, the ghost of Daniel's legs and Lederhosen. Uh, Daniel's thank legs. You, thank you so much. Thanks to our ghost uh, uh, visitors who are at their screens. Uh, um, to all of you, happy Christmas. Yeah, thanks, thank everyone. you to Invisible Anna. Thanks, thanks to all of you and have a very nice evening. Anna, Goodbye. Andreas. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> okay, I think.